Setting up the classroom environment is a process that needs to begin before the first day of school. It's an example of professional competence that demonstrates preparation and planning on the part of the teacher that's meant to set up the learning environment in the most effective way possible for both students and teacher. Traditional discourse suggests a forward-facing classroom and row-by-row arrangement, teacher standing at the front of the room in control, with the thinking that this is the best way to manage the classroom environment. The reality is, is that while it might be a more controlled form of classroom management, it isn't very conducive to 21st century learning skills like collaboration, communication, creativity, or critical thinking. All attributes of an active thinking classroom, all attributes of a classroom that has a sense of community and a vision of culture. Another aspect to think about when setting up your classroom are the explicit and implicit messages that are being communicated by the teacher to the students that suggest kind of your, your thinking around class culture and the value systems you have in place for your classroom. There's always messaging being communicated. A lot of that has to do with body positioning, nonverbal and verbal communication, even the way you've arranged the classroom and kind of manage your learning events. In this video, we'll talk about some of these different components, um, everything including presence in the classroom to actual management practices. Hope you enjoy this session and hope you understand um, how this fits into your preparation um, for getting the uh, school year started off on the right foot. Setting up the physical space in your classroom is about creating a learning environment that is successful for both the students and the teacher. A big part of this is accessibility. Not only accessibility with you, the teacher, but accessibility with peers, accessibility with the instruction, and accessibility with the resources around the room. Consider creating a seating chart before the first day of school based off the rosters that you have. Traditional discourse suggests that seating charts are meant as a punitive measure uh, to invo invoke power and control over your classroom. This isn't necessarily true, and a message like that can be harmful in the long run. Think about communicating this effectively in a way that puts it on yourself, where a seating chart is about learning names, uh, finding collaborative groups that work well together, and kind of setting up those expectations and routines that are going to be so pivotal to building classroom culture and community throughout the room. It doesn't mean that seating charts are permanent, it doesn't mean that seating charts can't change. They're very fluid. And again, they're meant to create the learning environment where everyone can be successful. One thing to keep in, in mind while you're doing this work is to take a look at the roster and identify those learners that are a bit unique in the supports they need or the attributes that they can bring to the classroom. Um, it's important to identify the IEPs, 504s, even students that need to sit close to the board and figure out where in the room they can be successful. This doesn't need to be communicated explicitly, but rather there's a way, a pattern, a method to how you organize your seating chart, um, but again with the idea that you're putting those students with unique needs right off the bat in a position to be successful throughout the year. Uh, the second part of accessibility was classroom resources. And again, this is work that needs to begin before the first day of school thinking about things like where your desk is going to go and how that desk functions. Are you going to be sitting there disconnected from the rest of the classroom, or might this be used as a, a quiet space, a place where students can maybe do a little bit more independent work and be passed from the rest of the class? Uh, think about setting up submission boxes organized by class period where students can take ownership of that process of submitting work without um, adding responsibility onto yourself for collecting papers at the end of the day. Other things to consider, boxes where students can access resources, missing work, anything that might have come up through absences or tardies. Again, this is all about giving students more ownership of the learning process. And again, relinquishing some power on your part, but at the same time, um, lessening the load of the responsibilities that you have within any given class period. Other things to consider are basic resources, things like tissues, pencils, paper, um, things that are essential to, for learning to take place, but also things that should never impede the actual instruction. We don't want something as simple as a, as a pencil or a piece of paper to be the, the barrier to kicking off class on a positive note. So just think about um, making sure that you're finding spaces for all this and that this is part of the routine and expectations 
uh, that you review early on in the year. Uh, lastly, classroom technology, which is a pivotal part of every classroom, also arguably the most expensive part of every classroom. Think about setting expectations and routines, finding a space in the classroom where those resources can be accessed in a responsible, controlled way, um, but still giving students a little bit of freedom and autonomy over that process. The last thing I'll say is that different contexts might have additional um, responsibilities with them. For example, a science classroom has things like safety resources, like a first aid kit, a fire blanket, fire extinguishers, uh, you know, showers, things that are essential and need to be understood where they are and how they're used. Um, also, you know, basic things about how to access the sink and the paper towels, how to clean up the, the experimental area. Um, there's a lot of different parts that go into it. Um, you know, start thinking about these different components right now uh, rather than um, after the first day of school when expectations and routines are already being established from that first second they step in the room. Arguably one of the biggest points of anxiety for new teachers is classroom management and how to manage the different personalities in the physical space of your classroom. A big part of class management is presence. And presence can be somewhat of an abstract term because it does have some aspects to it that are a little bit difficult to understand, such as disposition and personality. Some of those things are difficult to change and they take some time to adjust and kind of find your voice within the classroom. Uh, but I want to give you a few practical moves that you might be able to make um, to help you manage some of these different um, issues and disruptions that will inevitably occur in your classroom. Um, it's very typical for new teachers, or even veteran teachers for that matter, to stick themselves at the front of the room where all the content is located, perhaps where the, the Promethean board or the, the projector is aimed at. The issue with this is that it, it's, again, back to the explicit and implicit messaging, it implies a sense of, of a detached classroom where that side of the room is for the students, this side of the room is for me. There's a lot of power and control that is conveyed through that, but likewise, with distance comes disruption. The farther you are from, a part of, from an area of the classroom, the more likely that that part of the classroom is going to be emboldened, perhaps a little more disengaged. Um, and that's understood. So during any learning event, while there will be moments where you are at the front of the room setting up the learning event, giving instructions, modeling um, what that's going to look like uh, while they are doing it independently, once the, once the class gets going or even during your instruction, there's nothing to prevent you from navigating the room. And so if there is that room or that part of the room that is disruptive and disengaged, it doesn't take much more than just moving over there all while you're continuing your instruction and your direction, all while you're maintaining a good visual line of sight on the rest of the classroom. Remember, the classroom is yours. It belongs to you, it belongs to the students. And so at no given point should a teacher be detached from the rest of the room. That goes for your desk as well. Again, part of traditional discourse is that the teacher's desk is off limits. But the fact of the matter is the teacher really shouldn't be at their desk during the instructional time. Again, distance can lead to disruption, right? So make sure that you're not staying detached from the learning environment for any prolonged amount of time. And also think about making just a routine um, walk through the learning environment, asking questions, interacting with students in an authentic way, facilitating understanding in a way that um, is unique and specialized for the learners in your room. Another part of um, managing the classroom environment is body positioning. Again, during these moments of, of managing the classroom environment and navigating the room, it's important to understand that you are responsible for the entire classroom. And part of that requires an understanding and, a, and an awareness of who's in your room, who's coming in, who's going out. In a situation with, you know, if you have several doors, um, make sure that you always keep an eye on, on your entry points into your classroom. Um, we don't want to create an environment where students have free reign to come and go because that that's, has the potential to create issues out in the building, um, having more than one student out at once, losing track, or even students just being gone for a majority of the class period, all of which are problematic for any administration. Um, and again, they can also be disruptive to the learning environment that you've already set up. 
far as body positioning goes, to kind of alleviate this, always make sure that you keep your body facing the majority of the room. If you're going to work with a student individually, avoid cutting yourself off like this. In a situation like this, I can see this table, I can interact with the students at this table, but notice how I've become detached and disconnected from what's happening behind me. Again, little subtle moves like this that are nonverbal, but they're implying a sense of, of um, obliviousness on the, on the part of the teacher. It doesn't mean you're not paying attention. It doesn't mean you don't care. It just means that you set yourself up in a way where you can't see anything and your periphery is cut off to just a, a bit of the room. Better, better move than that is to just rearrange yourself. Put yourself here in a position where I can actually see the entire room now. Everything's in front of me. Um, doors, I can still, I still have a line of sight on the door. Um, and so everything, again, is, is within my, my vision, my line of sight. Um, and ideally, it's some, within, everything is within my own uh, ability to manage and control. Uh, last thing that I'll say about this is just the communication that's ongoing in the classroom. Teachers are constantly communicating, whether they're doing it verbally or non-verbally. And so things are going to happen. Disruptions are going to happen. Inevitably, there's going to come a moment where the entire class needs to be uh, refocused and they need to be um, reset, so to speak. If that does happen, you know, think about finding a spot in your room that implicitly communicates that you want to get control back. Perhaps it's here at the front of the room. And again, power and control can look a lot differently. Anybody can stand up at the front of the room and yell and use a powerful voice and you know, show an angry expression. But honestly, that doesn't do anything but elevate the noise level and the energy of the room. Again, it's about body language. It's about presence. Think about finding that spot that tells students, time to refocus, time to bring things back to me. That might include a lot of nonverbal eye communication. Um, that includes things like wait time and holding your spot. Um, but just understand, again, though, communication is always ongoing. And so even though um, you might be navigating the classroom, you might be um, up at the front of the room delivering instruction, you might even be under a, under a dot cam modeling out some problems in the math class, so to speak. The whole idea is that you're always communicating and that when those moments do come up, where there is a need for a reset um, of expectations, again, don't be afraid to stop your instruction. Bring it back to some of these nonverbal routines that you've already created and use some of that to your advantage. I hope some of these practices help you um, in the short term. These are definitely things that we're going to talk about throughout the year. But again, just things to start thinking about today um, before you get kids in the classroom.